Now, the best advice that I could give to any aspiring astrophysicist or any type of scientist out there is to learn to code. And that might come as a surprise to some of you, but it's actually one of the main parts of my job as a researcher, looking into how supermassive black holes affect the galaxies that they live in. So I've compiled a list of the five main ways that I use code in my job as an astrophysicist. Everything from processing images of galaxies that I've taken with telescopes to fitting models to that data. But before we go through all of those, we first need to figure out what do I actually mean by code? Now, if you're thinking cryptic messages and cracking ciphers, imitation game style, not that type of code. I'm talking about coding as a language, specifically a language that both you and a computer can understand so that you can then talk to it, give it a specific set of instructions. It's a bit like a recipe so that you can program a computer to do a very specific task for you. Anything from telling it to add some numbers together or how to format a web page, or even to designing a video game. All of these different tasks are best communicated to a computer with a specific language, usually a language that's defined for that set of tasks. For example, if you wanted to format a web page, you need a language that lets you tell it what font to use and how big to make an image on the page and what to do if people click on a specific button. To do that, people use HTML and programming languages like JavaScript. Whereas for a video game, you want a language that's going to let you communicate to the computer how a character or an object behaves as you interact with it, as you play the game. So people use languages like C++ and Java to do that. For science though, it's a different story. You need a language that's both powerful and flexible, that's gonna let you do things like read really large data tables, or make plots to visualize that data, or fit models to that data. Sometimes performing the same task over and over again, thousands if not millions of times, and ideally you want it to do that in seconds, or at least as fast as it can anyway. Now there's a couple of languages that can do this, that are both powerful enough, flexible enough, but the easiest to read of those, and therefore the most popular currently as well, is Python. And that is my language of choice as well. I like to say I'm a parcel tongue. And I use Python daily for doing my list of five things. So let's dive into this and start with number one, image processing. Now, the first thing any scientist needs to do some science is data. And in my case as an astrophysicist, that data is images of galaxies from telescopes, whether they be on the ground or in space. But there's lots of sources of noise in these images. And what I mean by noise is light, not from the object you care about, but from some other source that you don't care about. Whether that might be background noise from the sky itself with just light bouncing around the atmosphere, or whether it's noise in the detector. So if you just left the shutter closed and you kept the detector dark and still took an exposure, you would still detect some background residual of light. All of these sources of noise need to be accounted for and removed from your image so that you can do science with it. Essentially, you do that pixel by pixel, which is an incredibly tedious task, but it's one that a computer can do in seconds as long as you give it the right commands. Python is a perfect language for this because one of its many strengths is being able to deal with big arrays of numbers. And what is an image after all, but a big array of numbers with each number telling you how much light has been detected in each pixel. With code like this, which is Python using a lot of the AstroPy functions, an open source library of lots of coding functions to do astronomy related tasks, you can turn messy, fresh off the telescope images like this into useful scientific images like this with only the light from the thing you actually care about left in the image. The second thing I use code for is data analysis. So once you have your scientific image of an object, in my case, a galaxy, you might want to do some measurements on that image. So you might want to measure how big the galaxy is or how much light you've received from that galaxy in total, like how bright it is. Or you might want to record how bright the central region is compared to the outside region or the color and so on and so on and so on. 
And if you do that for tens of galaxies, 10,000 galaxies, a million galaxies, you're essentially gonna end up with a huge big data table of properties that you've measured. One of the longest data tables I have is over 600,000 rows long. That's 600,000 galaxies, each with different properties measured. It was far too long for any Excel spreadsheet to be able to handle. But again, Python is perfect for this because this is just another form of an array of numbers. And so I can use Python to play around with my data in this table. So for example, for every single row in this table, I might want to convert one of the measured properties in a column into another unit, or I might wanna use it to calculate another property, or I might wanna do some statistics on my sample. Either way, given the right commands, a computer can do all of this on every single row in your data table far quicker than either you or I would ever be able to do it by hand or universe forbid by splitting your data table into chunks on an Excel spreadsheet. Someone might wanna tell the UK government track and trace people that though. Number three, model fitting. So once you've got all of this data, you want to be able to understand the underlying physics of what's going on so that you can do some science. And one of the best ways to do that is actually to fit a model to your data. The best fit model can actually tell you a lot. It can tell you whether your assumptions about what physics is driving the results you're getting are actually right or not. Instead, if you have a terrible model, then you know that that idea was definitely wrong because it doesn't fit the data at all. The simplest form of that that people I'm sure will have come across is fitting a straight line to some data. It's just a test of whether two properties are correlated or not. For example, here I'm showing the mass of a galaxy's supermassive black hole and its overall mass in stars. You can see there's quite a lot of scatter, but it is still correlated. And that led to the hypothesis that galaxies and black holes co-evolve and grow in mass together. But another thing you might wanna do in terms of model fitting is infer an unknown from something you do know. For example, if a galaxy is very blue in color, it has a lot of hot, young, big stars. But if a galaxy is very reddish in color, it probably has a lot of old, cooler, smaller stars. I can then use those colors to ask, has that galaxy stopped forming stars recently? I do this by modeling the number of stars a galaxy formed as an exponential decline of various different rates. I can then turn that into model colors, knowing what we know about how different masses of stars are different colors. And then I can say, okay, well, which model best fits the observed color I have in this image of the galaxy I took? So again, with some well-placed Python commands, this time just to find the minimum of an equation, i.e. when the difference between the modeled and the observed colors is the smallest it can be, you can find your best fit model, and then off you toddle and do some science and make some conclusions about what's going on in the universe. Number four, data visualization. Now, once you've done all this data analysis and model fitting, you really need to be able to interpret all that information. And one way of doing that is actually to be able to see your data and visualize more clearly what's going on. Whether that's with a simple histogram of the spread of a certain measurement in your data or the location of objects on the sky or even interactive graphics that you can play around with to see relationships more clearly in your data. A few well-placed commands to your computer in Python and you can make some of the most beautiful scientific plots that will one day, hopefully, get published in a scientific research paper. Now the fifth thing in my list is simulations. This is when you code up all the laws of physics into a program and run that program to try and recreate what happens when planets form around stars or what happens when galaxies collide or maybe even what happens when a star gets too close to a black hole and gets spaghettified. Unsurprisingly, that is incredibly complex and it's something you have to dedicate your entire career to doing. I didn't do that because I wanted to use telescopes and look at real images of galaxies in the universe. Someone who did do that though is one of my best friends from my PhD, Dr. Ricarda Beckman, who's now a research fellow at the University of Cambridge, specialized in simulating how black holes grow. I rang her up to chat about how she uses code in her work. 
So how do you go about coding up something as complex as a black hole? So if you want to do a, a simulation of pretty much anything, like a black hole or a galaxy or any other phenomenon, the key thing to think about really is the underlying physics. So we very much have to think back to sort of the, the parts or the components that are of physics that are relevant in this particular context. Uh, and then we um, think about how to translate the physical laws uh, into some sort of computer algorithm. So for example, if I work with um, black holes a lot and I want to study, say, the evolution of gas near a black hole, what I'll do is I'll have to think about the gas physics. So I have to think about, okay, how does a gas behave, say, when the pressure changes, what happens to it? If you cool it or if you heat it, how does it, you know, move and evolve over time? So it will code up all these different sort of reactions on physical phenomena that go on at the same time. And then I have to think about the black hole and go, okay, so what does the black hole contribute to the situation? And for example, with black holes, it's typically the gravity that's the important part. So I will code up the laws of gravity. And then I can put all of this together and really study how a gas evolves under the gravity of a black hole and how the gas physics sort of evolve in this context. What we do is we build these very big codes that have all these different parts of physics in it. So I don't do all of this myself. Um, a lot of these codes are, the code I work with, for example, was started about 20 years ago or so, and there's a whole community working on it. Basically, we've sort of collectively built this incredible, powerful software machinery to do these simulations. That's so cool that you leave your own little contribution as well, like in the history of the field, I guess, even like students in 20 years time or researchers in 20 years time might be using like a little bit that you added. Right, exactly. So, you know, if it goes well, then, uh, and if that's still a, a phenomenon they're interested in at the time, and that's relevant for their physics, they will just use yeah, my code, the bit I added, and sort of, so I do my own work, but I also contribute to the sort of future of the field, in a sense. So what language do you actually use to code up, like, the laws of physics into this? Like, what's the, the best one for this application? So it depends a little bit on which part of it. So really, with doing simulations, there's actually more like two very uh, parallel uh, things we have to do. So the first thing we have to actually do the simulation and then we have to take the data produced by the simulation and sort of analyze and visualize and study it. And we use two different coding languages for the two different purposes. Um, so for actually running the simulations, this is um, what we call high performance computing. So it's computationally very expensive. You need very big supercomputers to do it. So the important thing here is to have a language that's efficient. So, you know, any amount of computational time, energy we can save in this is, is good. So we tend to work with all the more formalized languages in a sense. So I personally use Fortran, for example. Um, so these are ones that it's maybe a little more difficult to code, but because it's code we write once very carefully and then use many, many times, these sort of efficiency gains we get out of the language are really important and really worth it. So that's sort of the actual simulation code. But then once we got all this data, we need to go and look at it, analyze it, study it, you know. Um, and for that, I use Python because the point there is that we want to write quick code. We want to have, you know, be able to something that's intuitive. I want to be able to put something together and, you know, follow through on an idea really quickly. And I know you've talked about earlier about Python a lot. So I think for the exact same reasons, we, we use it for the analysis as well. I guess the big question though is why do we actually run simulations? Like why are simulations so important in astrophysics? The reason simulations are so important is because uh, in astrophysics, we have a few very particular challenges in this sort of particular science. So one of them is that it's awfully hard to do experiments because, you know, there's only one universe. It's really big. The timescales over which things evolve are incredibly long. So from observation point of view, we often just get the sort of individual snapshots of objects. And the powerful thing about simulations is that it makes these big timescales and these big length scales very tractable because we can essentially put together these simulations, which, you know, a big simulation would just look like a movie of an object evolving over giga years of time, and you can watch it in five minutes. So basically, it just gives us a chance to sort of build these evolution histories and then link that to the observations to see whether what we get out looks like what we think it should look like, like the observations. Um, and that allows us to sort of test whether the physics we put in originally, what I talked about earlier, really is all the relevant physics. If it looks like what we'd expected to, um, then we think we've understood it. If it doesn't look like what we'd expected to, then we have to go back and sort of, you know, go back and check our understanding. What did we miss? What did we maybe misunderstand? Where could the sort of, you know, di discrepancy come from? So really they're a way to test our understanding, but also to sort of, you know, get full sort of long-term evolution histories of things that otherwise might be much more difficult to study. It's nice to know that everyone can like come together and work together to create something, you know, as like complex as simulating the entire universe. Because I guess it feels overwhelming. Like, who, was the first, who was the first person that just like sat down and was like, right, time to start a simulation of the universe. Like that must have been so like, 
you know, where do you start? Yeah, I think it was somebody's PhD project. He's now a professor, well, the code I work with, he's now a professor in uh, in Zurich. So, you know, his, his entire career has been this code and he started it, he published the original paper that said, here's a new code. And then people have been building on it ever since. That's so cool. So. Thanks, Ricardo. <laughs> it was really great to speak yeah, to you. You're very welcome. <laughs> if you want to hear more from my chat with Ricardo, I'm going to be posting the full unedited version on my channel on Sunday. So keep an eye out for that. Thank you, Ricardo, for our nice little catch up there. I hope that helped you realize how astrophysicists like me and like Ricardo use code day to day in our research work. And after that, well, you might be quite inspired and you might want to learn to code yourself and not really know how to start. Well, I always find the best way is to learn by doing, which brings us to this week's video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a problem solving website with lots of interactive courses that break down problems into easy to understand chunks that are really fun too. They have courses on a huge range of science and maths topics, but I wanted to highlight their coding courses from the fundamentals of computer science and algorithms to a great course teaching you my favorite programming language, Python. It builds you up from the very basics on how to even read code and what it means to run code, and then how to deal with variables and manipulate them to do what you want to do. They also have a data visualization and a game writing course coming soon, which I'm very excited for. Perfect for all you budding scientists and astrophysicists out there. So if that sounds like something that you'd be up for and you want to support me and my channel, then head over to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, that's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y, and sign up for free. Plus the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. It's pretty good in my book. So thank you so much to Brilliant for that. And now everybody's favorite bit, Let's roll those bloopers. What? <laughs> I missed my chair when I sat down. I just had to sit on the arm of the chair. Oh, this is going so well. <laughs> you taught me a secret language that I can't speak with every other computer. It was over 600,000 galaxies. That's far too big for any Excel spreadsheet. Excel spreadsheet. God. Space is hard, words are harder.